welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today our guest is Jesse O'Brien. Jesse is the uh, health care advocate for the Oregon State Public Interest Research Group. So welcome to the show, Jesse. It's a real honor to be here. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Yeah, good. Tell us, tell us a little bit about Osberg. Well, so Osberg is a statewide uh, consumer group that's been working for the public interest in Oregon for over 40 years. Um, we have worked on a very broad range of issues ranging from environmental protection to uh, sort of classic consumer protection like uh, product safety issues as well as um, free and fair elections and um, improving health care for consumers. And uh, um, most likely your, your viewers will know us best from our door-to-door -door canvas that uh, reaches about uh, 50,000 Oregonians and has face-to-face -face conversations about public policy issues uh, every year uh, all across the state. Okay, all right. Uh, um, so you're their health care uh, advocate. Correct. You're new in that position. That's correct. I, I was brought on in May of this okay, year. Okay, right. And what had you done before that? Um, well, for, for most of my professional life, I was a social worker. Um, I worked in direct service uh, work with teenagers with mental health and uh, drug addiction problems. And I really enjoyed the work, but I found that uh, as I got better and better at it. I was recognizing the, I recognized the limitations that were placed on the work by the policy structures that were in place and became more and more frustrated by that. So I decided I wanted to do some work at a, at a sort of higher level to fix the, the systemic policy problems. And so I went back to school and got my master's in social work focusing on public policy. And uh, during that time, I had an internship where I worked in the Oregon State Capitol uh, during the 2011 legislative session when there was a lot of health reform uh, mm -hmm. work going on. And I just be became very interested in that and uh, the way it interacted with the social justice issues that I was involved with. And uh, so as soon as this job came up, it really seemed like a, a natural fit for me. Right. OK. Well, good. Good. Uh, t tell us about some of the other campaigns that Osberg uh, involves itself with. Well, we work on a very wide range of issues. Uh, one, one campaign that we've been working on for some time right now uh, that most likely some of your viewers will have heard about from our canvassers is uh, known as our Twinkies campaign, which is sort of a, a cute way um, of packaging uh, um, not so cute issue, which is um, tax subsidies going to giant profitable agribusiness uh, that wind up subsidizing junk food. Um, we've been working along with the whole Federation of State PERGs, um, public interest research groups across the nation to get uh, the federal farm bill to remove um, all tax subsidies that go to, to uh, fund junk food, essentially, because in a time of, of record deficits, spending taxpayer money on um, basically promoting childhood and adult obesity just seems absurd. Um, so that's one major campaign we're working on right now. So um, you, because this will be before your time, but uh, in uh, 2006, we had two initiatives uh, that were on the, on the ballot, 46 and 47, which mm -hmm. had to do with campaign finance reform. And Osford was one of the organizations that endorsed both of those measures, and for that we were very thankful. And I was one of the chief practitioners, which is why I say we. <laughs> Absolutely, and we do we do a lot of work having to do with um, ensuring that our democracy is strong and that we have free and fair elections. And so right now, for example, we're just uh, starting a campaign in coalition with um, a number of other groups to try to uh, build support for a congressional amendment that would overturn the Citizens United Supreme Court decision. Um, we have some, some folks in my office who are working very hard uh, trying to build political support for that uh, across the political spectrum uh, right now. Yes. It's, uh, we have a, an interesting um, potential uh, opportunity for building a real co a real sort of uh, bipartisan coalition around that issue right now. I think. Right, yeah, and, and we would certainly need to have a bipartisan yes. coalition. And one thing to say about, about Osberg and our approach is that we really do try to identify issues where we can organize a very broad cross-section of Americans across party lines um, around a common vision of the public interest. And in our very polarized society, that's, that's difficult. Um, in a lot of areas right now, but that's that's really our vision for how to uh, how to move forward. Yeah. So uh, let, let's let's get to what you're an expert at. 
sure. uh, the, the health care. Um, just give us an overview of what's where Oregon is right now uh, versus where it was even a couple of years ago? Well, there's a lot of very exciting, uh, very promising initiatives going on in Oregon right now in the healthcare uh, field. Um, Oregon is broadly considered a leader in innovative health policy. Uh, hey, let me just ask you, I, I think Oregonians tend to think of themselves as leaders in a lot of things. Absolutely. Are, 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 are we regarded as a leader in other states, or is this something we just believe about ourselves? No, I, I can I can actually <laughs> say for a fact that uh, uh, I, I recently actually attended a national conference of health advocates in Philadelphia with people from all over the country, and uh, despite the fact that I'm I'm sometimes frustrated with where Oregon is on on health care, you know, I, I I feel like we're not doing enough for consumers. Um, People at the conference still look to us as as uh, really sort of going in the direction that they that they want their own states to go. Even mm -hmm. even in some states that um, are more solidly sort of blue states, where you might expect that that there would be uh, more potential for for moving forward on on these issues. Uh, for for example, Illinois, um, they they they're very frustrated with where they're at with health policy right, right now, and they look to Oregon and. Um, some of the people working there have actually asked me um, how they how they could sort of build on on the okay. work that we're doing. Okay, well that, that's uh, excellent. I just wanted to be sure that when we say the Oregon's on the forefront, that we're not just patting ourselves on the back right. and making ourselves feel good. I do agree that that's something that Oregonians do a lot of, and it can be a problem. <laughs> but uh, in healthcare, we are actually doing some very interesting things. Um, we uh, in a, significantly in advance of the Federal Affordable Care Act, uh, so-called Obamacare. Um, we passed a number of statewide uh, pieces of legislation that really um, sort of set the, set the stage for moving forward in, in uh, implementing those things. So, so in 2009, which is a year before the Affordable Care Act was passed, uh, we passed legislation that uh, dramatically expanded the ability of the state government to regulate um, private health insurance uh, in terms of rates, in terms of um, basically, uh, you know, the, 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 the benefits that, um, pri that private in health insurers are, are allowed to um, change, these sorts of things. Um, and uh, we passed a law um, establishing a health insurance exchange, um, which, as probably most people know, is a big part of the Affordable Care Act that uh, each state is expected to set one of these up. Uh, Oregon started on the path to set one of these up well ahead of most of the country. Okay. Um, and uh, we, are, we are going full steam ahead in, in implementing these things. Um, and uh, in addition to that, there's, there's also a very, um, a very sort of homegrown Oregon initiative uh, associated with uh, Governor Kitzhaber to transform the uh, Medicaid system in the state. Um, it's often called the Medicaid transformation um, project, and the idea is basically to replace the current um, the current system of Medicaid service provision with a series of regional uh, so-called coordinated care organizations. Um, so there'll, there'll be a number of these across the state that serve the Medicaid eligible population in, in their, their region, and then. Uh, they will be basically held accountable um, by the state for keeping those people healthy. Um, and it's really, uh, I can go into the details a bit later, but um, it's a really interesting uh, and unique in the nation sort of initiative that okay. uh, a lot of other states are looking to. Okay, all right. So talk a little bit more about the exchanges. What, what are the exchanges? What are they supposed to be doing? And how do they cut costs? Sure. Um, so uh, a health insurance exchange is basically a new... Um, version of a marketplace for health insurance. And there are a lot of ways of setting up an exchange. But the basic idea is um, you set up a website, fundamentally, uh, that people can go to and uh, it will give consumers tools to, to shop between different plans. It, it'll enable con consumers to make comparisons between plans, apples to apples, which is something that's very difficult right now because mm -hmm. You know, it's very difficult for consumers to know, is it better to have, you know, this lower premium but this higher out-of-pocket cost in this way or in this way? And it's, there's all these sort of shades of gray. Um, and in the exchange, it'll really sort of 
lay out uh, how you can make those choices in a more informed way. Um, and you know, that's the, the really basic part of an exchange. But the exciting part of an exchange from a consumer perspective is that um, it gives us an opportunity to leverage the buying power of um, people who currently don't have a lot of leverage to negotiate with health insurance companies to get a better deal. Uh, so these would be people who are not covered by by uh, by employer based insurance where, well where it's in it's primarily meant for people who are not covered by any employer based in insurance or people who are covered by uh, small employers so less less than 50 employees mm -hmm. um, and uh, those people will be able to go on the exchange and uh, the uh, if you purchase insurance through the exchange um, Obamacare will so-called Obamacare will uh, enable you to access tax credits um, for purchasing insurance that are not available for people outside the exchange. Oh. So there's sort of a built-in marketplace there for oh. people who... And who, an incentive uh, for them to be involved with it. And an incentive for them to buy on the exchange, yes. Um, so then the exciting thing is that since there's this built-in marketplace, uh, the exchange has the ability to act as a sort of pool, uh, a purchasing pool of this huge population of people. Um, conservative estimates say that it'll be um, multiple hundreds of thousands of Oregonians going on to uh, onto the exchange starting in 2014 when these all uh, get off the ground. Um, and uh, basically the way the exchange could build a better deal for consumers is by saying to the, the health insurance industry, if you want access to this huge, brand new marketplace, you have to play by our rules. You have to you have to build a better deal for consumers by containing your costs, by showing that you're improving the quality of care for everyone, um, by really do uh, really doing the kind of systemic change in uh, service delivery that we all think we need um, in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a number of ways you can set up an exchange to do that. Uh, and right now, the Oregon Health Insurance Exchange is making a lot of decisions about how they're going to set up their own system. Um, so, it, and when I say right now, I mean literally in the next couple of weeks uh, is an okay. important um, so decision probably, period. Probably about the time that this show actually is airing Correct. Will, will be when they're actually starting to do this. Right, when, when they will be making the decisions. Uh -huh. um, and then uh, you know they've said they've said that they will revisit those decisions later on if it turns out that they're not that they're not doing the best job they could of so controlling not set costs. In stone, but really. yeah, nothing is set okay. in stone. Yeah, and so uh, is o Oregon is ahead of the curve in terms of where other states are in this process? Absolutely. Uh, there there are currently only uh, something like fourteen states that are trying to set up their own health insurance exchange at all. Um, most states are expecting that the federal government is going to set it up for them, which is one of the provisions in the Affordable Care Act, no. that if the state doesn't set up their own, then the federal government will do it for them. And uh, it's great that Oregon is, is um, setting up its own because then we, re we really have a chance to shape it in a way that can work best for Oregon consumers um, by making it have standards um, for health insurance that really work for the Oregon marketplace. Okay. okay. All right. Now you talked about coordinated care uh, organizations also, and that's separate from what we've just been talking about. That's correct. Okay. And and those uh, those affect Medicare. Those affect Medicaid. Medicaid. Okay. Uh, so right. Medi Medicaid is the health insurance program for. Um, basically for uh, poor and uh, disabled Americans. Um, it a actually, most of the, the spending gets spent on, on uh, elderly, elderly folks who, whose uh, Medicare coverage doesn't cover at all of the care that they need. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a program that, that is run by the individual states. And um, even though uh, it's, it's actually done a better job than a lot of, a lot of other um, health insurance uh, programs of containing costs. Uh, it's still the, the cost of, of providing care is going up so fast that um, the costs of Medicaid to the states are, have, has really become unsustainable in the long term. Um, so what's going on in, in Oregon is really that they're, they're trying this 
pretty big experiment to make uh, the long-term trajectory of Medicaid costs uh, go down um, by actually keeping people healthy in the first place, uh, reorienting Medicaid um, spending toward prevention as opposed to spending on expensive acute care when people are sick down the line. Um, so it's really, it's trying to reorient the whole way that the medical system treats um, disease by getting people to focus on, getting providers to focus on the whole person, getting them to coordinate their efforts more so that they, they catch problems before they become big acute problems and so forth. Um, do, do, do you have any specific examples of how that works, you know, like, a, like an individual without naming names, but... Sure. Uh, I mean, there's, there's tons of examples. One, one of uh, Governor Kitzhaber's favorite examples is um, a, a, a middle-aged woman with a heart condition who um, was struggling in the heat um, with, with her condition. The heat was causing, was causing her to have trouble breathing, and um, uh, she went to the doctor and said, you know, I need something to deal with the heat. And he said, well, we can't there's nothing we can really do to deal with the heat. And uh, so she just went home. Um, and then you know the, the heat wound up causing her to have this horrible acute condition that wound up costing uh, tens of thousands of dollars in, in acute treatment. Um, and of course, you know, s serious uh, misery for her in terms of her, her health and, and happiness. Um, when, if there had been a way to just Give, give this woman a you know fifty dollar air conditioning unit. This whole thing could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's I mean that's a fairly simplistic example, but just the idea is to try to try to find innovative ways of helping people that that find the you know fifty dollar air conditioner instead of instead of eventually having to undergo complicated uh, expensive surgery. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Good. Um, so we've been we've been talking about what Oregon has been doing to contain costs, but not for containing costs for uh, employer uh, insurance, <laughs> insurance, employer provided insurance. Is Osberg and is Oregon working on that aspect of the of the question as well? Well, I think I think there's. I think there's a couple of ways to answer that. I think there's a very long-term sort of strategy that Oregon is trying to implement in this, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. But first I would say the biggest problem is actually with um, the people who are buying health insurance on their own or the people who work for, for small businesses. Uh, lar people who receive care through large businesses have a fair amount of negotiating power and they, they generally get much lower rates um, from health insurance companies. Uh, there's also, of course, a separate problem of, you know, the, the vast um, number of uninsured people in Oregon and, and across the country. And uh, the Affordable Care Act with, with its subsidies will hopefully help address that. But in terms of the, the long-term trajectory of costs, um, it's a huge problem and everybody recognizes that it's going to be a problem even for people who are getting their insurance through large employers like Intel and Nike. Uh, it's just that the underlying cost of providing medical care to anyone has been going up astronomically, and we need to find solutions to this. Um, and I think, and this is, this is uh, very broad strokes, but I think that the, the basic sort of strategy that Oregon has been taking in this area is uh, we establish these coordinated care organizations in Medicaid. We establish the exchange. Um, and then once these coordinated care organizations are off the ground, they can start offering their services to people through the exchange. And then, you know, we can keep expanding the population of people who goes to the exchange. Um, and the coordinated care organizations could act sort of like the, the so-called uh, public option that um, President Obama um, originally proposed for the exchange. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that sort of competition with the private market could significantly uh, drive costs down, in part by really giving the private insurance companies an incentive to start doing the same sort of uh, coordination of care that really keeps people healthy in the first place and keeps costs down. Okay. But 
uh, it's, it's a huge puzzle and it's going to take going to take a long time. Yeah, uh, we have had uh, a couple of doctors on our show uh, who are advocates for single payer health care, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that they would say that probably 30 or 33 percent of the costs associated with health care now is the administrative cost of of private health insurance uh, and would advocate for what they call single-payer health care, Canadian-style health care. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, I think, I think that uh, I, I think that there's definitely a case to be made if you if you look at at uh, healthcare costs in other countries that have a single payer system that they they've done a much better job of controlling costs and in in the in the U.S. we have the highest healthcare costs in the world, um, but we don't have we don't have uh, comparably the highest health outcomes in the world. So there's there's definitely a serious problem there, I, and I think that um, I think that you know. Ultimately, we we at Osberg will work with whatever system of of healthcare, um, whatever political system is in front of us to to make it work the best we can for consumers. Uh, the moment there's a political opening for something like single payer that could that could really uh, get rid of the the even the potential for that kind of administrative bloat that that the, those doctors are talking about. We would be on board. In our judgment, right now, the the politics of the issue just aren't there, mm -hmm. and um, we need to build political support for uh, the reforms that we already have going, because those those are under attack from all sides. Mm -hmm. And um, once once we can get those off to, off the ground and show that they work, then we'll be in a better position to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I could imagine that uh, the political right, conservatives, fiscal conservatives, those who want to see less government are very upset with the proposal or the law that Obama was able to get passed and what you just described because it really does subject insurance companies to a, a tremendous uh, increased amount of regulation which right. you know they typically oppose so well it's um, it's it's interesting because in Oregon there's actually a fair amount of bipartisan momentum um, in the direction of, of health reform uh, and this is in part because um, there was a really great coalition organizing uh, uh, action that happened in you know 2008 2009 uh, before the politics of, of Obamacare and and uh, uh, the whole uh, repeal Obamacare movement on the right started up um, so that there's really some buy-in in Oregon into you know this is something we're doing in Oregon it doesn't have to do with the national politics of the thing um, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, finish this conversation without getting to um, what I think is one of the most important pieces of um, our work on healthcare, which is what has to do with uh, health insurance rate review. Okay. Um, I think that this is something that your uh, audience would find very interesting. Um, not a lot of people are necessarily aware that this program exists. Um, so or Oregon is one of a handful of states that has a program called rate review, um, and. The way this works is uh, if you're a health insurance company operating in the individual or small group market, so basically offering insurance to anyone who doesn't get their insurance through a, a large employer, uh, you have to get your rates approved by uh, state regulators. Uh, and there's a process where the insurance companies have to submit uh, justification for raising their rates every year. When they, if, they, if they're raising their rates, they have to submit a justification, and it has to say, we have to, you know, basically the idea is that they have to prove that they need to raise their rates because the underlying cost of care is going up. Uh, they can't just say, you know, we want to make some more money, and so we're raising our rates. Um, they have to show that the underlying costs are going up, and they have to prove that they're, that they're working to contain their administrative costs, they're working to lower the underlying cost of care. Um, and like I was saying, Oregon is one of a handful of states that does this in an effective way. 
Um, and that's a pretty new thing because traditionally, I can always remember reading the paper that, you know, to name a name, Blue Cross Blue Shield is going to increase their uh, rates 6% or right. 20% or, you know, uh, or, or it might have been, you know, any of the other, other companies. Uh, and it was pretty much always approved. Right. Yeah, so, so um, this, this actually goes back a couple of years, again, to 2009 uh, in, in uh, the very productive health reform session they had in the Oregon legislature then. They passed a law saying that, um, that basically the state has much greater authority to, uh, to um, you know, approve, decline, or cut back um, rate requests and it expanded the authority of the state to consider different factors. Um, and since then, uh, as you can see from this document that we, we show to, um, to our members uh, when we go door to door and so forth, uh, it has been very effective. Um, there, there have been rates that have been cut back uh, from over 20% to 12%. Um, there have been rates that have been cut back just a little bit. Um, in fact, most, um, most large increases that have been proposed since uh, the beginning of around uh, 2011 have been cut back to some degree, and it saved Oregon consumers over $37 million. Um, that, that number is actually a very conservative estimate. Uh, I think it's more on the order of 50 to $60 million. Uh, we need to go back and look at the math on that. But um, it has been, been a success in saving consumers money. And this is something that I, I, I want to emphasize because I think it's something that um, your viewers would find interesting and something they can b get involved in personally. Because um, Osberg is very involved in uh, advocating for um, greater scrutiny of, of these, uh, these rate hikes on the part of the state government. And uh, we regularly submit comments when, uh, when a rate hike proposal comes forward. And uh, in Oregon, this process is very uh, transparent. So it's actually possible for the public to get directly involved. Um, so, I mean, one thing I would say is that you could become an Osberg member, and then we would give you we would give you constant updates on this. Um, if you're interested in more information, you could also contact me personally, of course. But um, regardless, you can also go to the state's website um, for rate review, which is um, OregonHealthRates.org, um, I believe, um, where they have a list of uh, all of the open. Uh, rate filings, they're called filings, those are the justifications, um, and uh, you can leave public comment um, on any of them. And uh, it's, it's a very transparent process. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jesse. This Thank the Alliance for Democracy is sponsoring a screening of a new documentary film, Heist, Who Stole the American Dream? This explosive new documentary goes back to the roots of the American economic crisis, tracing them back to 1971, secret memo entitled Attack on American Free Enterprise System, written by the future Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell. Thanks to our crew today for being here, Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to you, our audience, for watching. We hope that you'll tune in again next week. Bye.